The 4th of June at Eton. On this great day, the college presents itself to its own world as its own world likes best to think of it, as the preserve of the English ruling class and the source of most of their virtues. Its world is reminded that on these playing fields, the Battle of Waterloo was won by an unflappable upper crust, which has never ceased since then to maintain a rich supply of top people from the same mould. The bishops, the ambassadors, the generals, the Tory cabinets, the landed gentry, and other blessings. This is what used to be called the top drawer. To most of these people, it would be unthinkable to send their son anywhere else. To the rest, his presence here is the culmination of a life's ambition. Even as a policy, it pays off. Eton is reputed to have the most influential old boy network in existence. There's not much that can't be fixed between a selected half dozen old Etonians. The ceremonies of the 4th of June are tribal and not directed outwards. They serve to intensify a group feeling. It's a sentimental, nostalgic occasion whose message seems to be not only that what was always done at Eton still is done and always will be, but a hint that the confident world in which these river rituals once had a significance for the whole British tribe may not have gone forever. On the riverbank on the 4th of June, it might still be 1913, when the antics of the ruling class were a source of pride to the people and Englishmen were, by and large, one nation, with shared prejudices and the common belief in the rightness of the social setup. It might be 1913, but it isn't. And this time, the serene rites were rudely interrupted by a plague of marchers. Young people who hold as an article of faith what in others is merely a growing suspicion, namely that if the top drawer were prized open, a strong smell of privilege and mothballs would emerge, and little else relevant to the state of the nation. How much of this is jealousy and prejudice? What in fact goes on at Eton in the course of a day? Eton College began its long life as the noblest grammar school in the kingdom, with free lodging and tuition for 70 scholars. More than 500 years after the founder, King Henry VI, laid down its statutes, there are still 70 King's scholars at Eton. At a quarter past seven any morning in the summer term, or half as they call it, the day has begun where it began for the original 70. Yes? Is it Peter's 1881 we got to do the cultures? Yes, that's right. Well, in Peter's 80, how do you translate Paris to be by in part? Second singular, heiress indicative passive, Paris squared, sir. Debbie, you did. These are junior boys and wear the ends of their white ties tucked into the collar. And if they're less than five feet one, it's a broad, turned down Eton collar. There are 15 of them, the only boys at Eton without rooms of their own. They live in chamber, all that's left of an enormous room where for centuries all 70 colleges lived and were locked up for the night to their own devices. These included bullying as a fine art, and up to about a hundred years ago, catching rats to eke out the sparse and dreadful college food. Hargreaves are very enterprising. Colleges who are called tugs wear gowns. The others, called oppidans, don't. The colleges are king's scholars and, by definition, intelligent boys. The others may or may not be. The old quarrel between the two on this score is now only a ghost in the feverish minds of very small boys. King Henry's plan for Eton allowed any number of boys from outside to share in the teaching at the college if they arranged their own board and lodging. The teaching became famous, the boys came flocking in, and lodging houses to cater for them sprang up all around the college. They're still there. They are Eton's houses. And though the men in charge of them nowadays are schoolmasters, not lodging house keepers, they have retained a good deal of their ancient independence. There are 25 houses at Eton of various sizes, and more than 1,100 boys live in them, the Oppidans. They outnumber the colleges by 15 to 1. 
Most of Eaton's peculiar flavour is due to the early Oppidans. It must have been difficult to treat them as children. They paid out their lodging housekeepers with their own money. They brought tutors with them to help with the work. They had to think on their feet and order their own lives. To this day, the Eaton Manor is a mixture of independence and competence. Even a quarter of an hour before early school, there's little sign of life. But however independent they may be at Eton, they have to be in their places by 25 past seven for 45 minutes work before breakfast. Seven twenty-five, just made it. Will you take on for now? Meanwhile, the rural ditties were not mute, tempered to the oaten flute, rough satyrs danced, and fawns with cloven heel. From the from the glad sound would not be absent long, and old Demetrius loved to hear our song. Thank you. In all its essentials, this class has been going on in lower school for 520 years. It gives a rather jerky effect, sort of staccato, just smooth it out. Cooper? For we were nursed upon the self same hill, fed the same flock by fountain, shade and rill. Together both, there the high lawns appeared, under the opening eyelids of the morn. We drove a field, and both together heard what time the grey fly winds her sultry horn. Breakfast is at ten past eight, a do-it-yourself meal which you don't take long about, and until nine o'clock your time's your own. Except in some of the new houses, Eaton interiors are apt to be pretty stark. One of the things you can do after breakfast is read all the newspapers in a sort of cellar. <laughs> <laughs> At Eton, you're expected to take an interest in what's going on in the world. They hope you may make some mark in it, and there's a strong anti-parochial attitude. The inside world is catered for by Eton's own newspaper, the Eton College Chronicle, published once a week. I see very little correspondence this week. I what know. Do you know, all over the editor's book, they've got old editors saying, so you know, tip number seven usually, write letters yourself under pseudonyms. I think maybe we ought to try... The joint editors, a colleger and an oppidan, take very much their own line and criticise in their leaders even the most sacred of Eton's institutions. They hold opinion polls on such matters as the abolition of fagging or corporal punishment or the school dress. It's a big myth, isn't it, that, about being in mourning for George III, you know, I think one's always told. I thought that was the reason it was introduced. I don't think so. I think it was just a fashion, wasn't it, in the last century or a little before. At ten minutes to ten, chapel. Compulsory chapel. Anglican, of course, and officially regarded at Eton, as at practically all the public schools, as the central fact in the school's life but it's not too central to be examined by the Chronicle. Nostalgic remembrances of College Chapel on a warm summer's evening, the Chronicle says, are neither here nor there. They may be valid emotional experiences, but they do not necessarily have anything to do with religion. What they are in fact commending is school spirit. Praying. 
The Lord God Almighty, leave us not, we beseech thee, destitute of thy manifold gifts, nor yet of grace to use them always to thy honor and glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Methods of Christian propaganda ought to be brought up to date, the Chronicle says, and it goes on, compulsory chapel has no value unless it is an instrument for this purpose. If it is anything less than this, it becomes a hollow pseudo-religious ritual, no different from those which Christ incessantly condemned in the established religion of his day. In fact, under the new headmaster, the old rigor about chapel attendance has been considerably softened. Eaton's curriculum is in process of revision since the universities now require A-levels and won't accept the college's own examination. But the methods are still very largely traditional. There's a good deal of learning by rote, with groups of little boys hearing each other their construct. Uh, number one, number one was I. How would you say by day? Um, dear. Crumble faced three problems. The first was the problem of Ireland. Eton seems to be a sort of cross between a medieval university, where they accepted boys at 12 years old, and a comprehensive school. Comprehensive because Eton accepts all streams except the very lowest. It has never required a highly intellectual standard of entry. Its aim is to educate the whole man. To this end, it deploys a staff of the highest quality, a tutorial system which ensures that it can never be out of touch with the progress of any boy, and a unique tradition of personal freedom. A jewel is taken to be 10 to the power of seven ergs because a jewel is the work done by a force of one newton when it moves through one meter. So a jewel... You can work very hard or, theoretically, you needn't. The system goes to great lengths to leave the choice to you. In the past, the college has succeeded best with boys of high academic ability or those with practically none who chose an athlete's life. Few can afford that anymore, and the average boy has to earn a living. In jewels. In many a battle, you've left out Maltese, you put just o by the one. Besides all the normal lectures and classes, every boy comes under the tutorial system. Junior boys meet their tutor in groups for what's called pupil room. And here he takes them for work of all kinds which they have been set by him or other masters. This is by no means the same as the mere supervision of prep, but active teaching. Prep at Eton is a boy's own affair and done in his own time. Jupiter with one P, please, in English. The Tyrian girl, like a bull. In the guise of a bull would be a better translation for Ut, as, literally as a bull, in the guise of a bull, right? Mm. She clung on to it, didn't she? Clung on to one thing and clung on to another, with her right, with her left, to cling on to it, right? And she feared the touch, tactus. You know tango, tangri, tetigi, tactum? The noun. Plural there, if you scan it, you'll find it is tactus lured his back beneath the waters in order that you left out this word very important more strongly literally well you're rather wasting my time the point of this is that you could write a good essay with some sensible material bring it back at um 7 15 this evening all right mm -hmm. with the gaps already corrected if you can in green so that we can see them and then we can construct between ourselves a rather better essay as such it's very vexing i'm not really free that but however all right, do better next time. For senior boys, the tutorial is an individual session. The system originated in the old days of the lodging houses when the Oppidans brought their tutors with them. The old universities have the same system. Etonians have, in fact, been living undergraduates' lives for years before they reached the university. This French essay of yours, quite a good introduction. Then we had tea or something. Quite a perceptive conclusion. Nothing to do with the introduction, of course and the odd random point in between. Even different ink ones is. Um, forget this essay. The subject rather matters. What is a cultivated man? Starting in the beginning, I suppose. A man who is looking for something deeper in life than the business of eating and sleeping and working. Yes, one well, won't accept that, of course. But take a range of figures, Montaigne, Goethe, whoever they may be, haven't they got something in common which could lead you towards an appreciation of what the ideal cultivated man might be? Are you talking about these authors or the characters that they write about? Or, well, both. Fair question. 
But of course both, because after all, they end their personal lives. Not all bad, but always interesting. And also as creative artists and the fictional characters they create. Oh, one eye, the loud as snow, oh, Damon dear. This realm dismantled was, of Jove himself, and now reigns here, a very, very page -op. You might have rhymed. Oh, good Horatio, I'll take the ghost's word for a thousand pound. Did perceive? Very well, my lord. Upon the talk of poisoning? I did very well note him. Then in come Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and you see Hamlet's got his experiment successful, he knows now the king's done it, and goes off into wild, exultant talk about it, when really what ought he to be thinking of? Well, planning to kill the king. Yes, because the king's now warned, and time will be short in which he can do it. There are out-of-school tutorials, too, called private business. These can be anything from Mozart on a gramophone to political arguments or reading from Shakespeare. One thing's obvious, tutors at Eton are by no means idle. Eton looks more like a university town than a town with a school in it. The houses are scattered all over the place like colleges at Cambridge, and the boys spend a good deal of time in the street. This probably puts a fine edge on the Etonians' famous air of self-possession. Eton is full of tourists. Coach loads of them moving on from Windsor Castle up the Thames make a stop at Eton to photograph the boys in their quaint clothes. You grow an extra skin if you have to be a chimpanzee's tea party. The town has a population of about 2,000, and practically every one of them is in business with the school. Most of the shops are there because the school is, and many of them have been serving Etonians for generations. Besides the predictable sports shops, there are antique shops and the jewellers for birthday presents, several sophisticated tailors, though school clothes are off the peg nowadays, and of course the shop that first springs to mind at school. At Eton it's called the Sock Shop. It gives some idea of the value of the Eton trade that when recently a free period before lunch was made a working period, the Sock Shop lost £100 a week. As there's no natural focal point at Eton, it has had to be created. And at five minutes past eleven every morning, the school staff meets the headmaster in chambers. Staff common rooms don't exist at Eton, and this is the only opportunity the staff has to get together and discuss matters of common concern. There are 112 Eton masters, or beaks as they're called, and up to the last war, the charge against Eton was that it was too inbred. A very high proportion of its masters were old Etonians. It's a good indication of how far Eton has stirred from its Narcissus-like trance that now only 25 out of 112 went to Eton, and that for the first time in centuries, the headmaster himself was not there. At Eton, a housemaster is almost as independent as the president of a university college. But in three vital matters, the headmaster is paramount. He appoints the housemasters, he settles the curriculum, and he is the magistrate. I found him in the sixth school on Monday in my house when he should have been in school. Nigel's is from modern tutor. What's he like normally? Has he been in the bill before? I rather he, yeah, he hasn't. He's been he there. hasn't been in the bill. He's yeah. a very good boy, working very well. Yeah. And um, I think completely for lenient. In his capacity as magistrate, the headmaster may receive at chambers four or five complaints against boys. The masters who make the complaints will consult with him, and the names of the offenders will go down on a list which is called the bill. The beaks leave chambers and become immersed in a sort of general scrimmage. This is the only chance in the day for a boy to be sure of meeting a master he wants to speak to. Indeed, anybody who has any business with authority is here outside chambers in the mid-morning break. This is, in fact, the only general point of convergence in Eton. Conveniently near this point of focus is the school office, where all the business of internal communication and administration is carried on by the school clerk. Yes. Those are the people for the bell. See you at 12.15. Thank you. You'd better do the ones that are a bit further away. Because of your leg. That's my leg. Well, basically, then uh, I'll do 
Dodd of James, Queen's, Boyle, Boyle and Music School. School. So you better do that one in the room. room. Okay. Are the other ones? Addington. Yes, okay, okay. Yeah. fine. These two sixth formers, one an Offerton and one a Colleger, act as the headmaster's representatives for one week. They're called preposters. During their week of duty, they do no school work. What they're concerned with now is the bill, the list of boys who are summoned to see the headmaster. The preposters are very much aware that they're the chief magistrate's representatives. No knocking on doors. So at 12.15 every day, a row of boys waits on the headmaster's staircase. The bill is not necessarily a list of offenders. It also contains the names of boys whom the headmaster may wish to commend or congratulate. your complaint of for missing the last school yesterday, the last school in the afternoon. Why weren't you in it? Well, sir, I was having a reading school in my room, sir. I thought I was meant to because the master, Mr. Pilkington, said he would be away then. But he wasn't away, was he? He was taking school. Yes, he was. Well, did you read the notice board in your house? Yes, sir, but I thought, as Mr. Pilkington was, would be away then, sir. I thought we would stay in our rooms, but I got the wrong division. How do you mean it was the wrong division? Well, it was the morning one, sir. He went, you thought Mr. Pilkington was taking that division. In fact, he was taking the morning one. Yes. Yes, I see. You're quite sure that you um, didn't miss it intentionally? Yes. Did you miss it quite entirely by accident? Yes. Yes, I see. Well, I think all the same, you know, that you, you really must, um, you're quite old enough now to know which master is supposed to be taking you at which time, in which school, and you wasn't to confuse your divisions now. Well, um, I think under the circumstances, as you haven't been in the bill before, I'll just simply ask you to uh, do the same amount of work, 45 minutes work, to do on uh, the next half of the afternoon. That's tomorrow, all right? Yes. Uh, and uh, he'll say... In so large a school as Eton, the bill may be the only chance in his career that a boy gets to speak to the headmaster. The headmaster himself is concerned with advance along the whole educational front. A housemaster's command is almost an independent one, but he could not, for example, exempt his boys from early school. What the boys learn, and in what proportion of their time, is the headmaster's affair. And it's in this role that the headmaster leads the school forward. What confronts the present headmaster is the need to compete for university places and the fact that the average Eton boy will need to earn his living. Can he tilt the balance in favour of the average boy's career without resorting to un-Etonian compulsions? The last division of the morning, once a voluntary work period, is now a compulsory one. The sock shop mob has vanished from the street, and until lunchtime, boys who are not doing classes must be in their houses working. The boys' own rooms are fundamental to the Eton scheme of education. From the moment you enter the school, you have your own room to live in and to work in, in your own time. This is Eton's chief excellence. It takes the curse off the public school system. A boy with a room of his own is on his own. He is neither sustained nor intimidated by communal pressures, as are boys in other public schools who are always part of a crowd. This is why there's no such thing as an Eton type. If you can spot an Etonian, it's because he's so much his own man, even down to the decoration of his room. But even if you're in your room at the appropriate time, it doesn't always mean you're working. 
If a fag is pushed for time, he'll take it out of working hours. Though fags are called upon to do their fag master's chores, they're relieved of a good many of their own. There are maids to make their beds and tidy up their rooms. But these maids and the whole domestic economy in the house are in the charge of what at Eton is called a dame. What stores do you want? Yes, I'd like a more head. Yes. And yes. Uh, toilet rolls. Toilet polish. Toilet soap. Toilet soap. Mm -hmm. Polish. Mm -hmm. And then what, um, is anything broken anywhere? And you, well, the washing, the washing the library. library, yes, I've got that. The hinge on the cupboard door. Yes. Oh, oh yes, that piece of the cupboard. Was. Yes. By the way, have they been to see The positions that? of both dame and housemaster have evolved from the lodging housekeepers of the old days. And the housemaster, known as Matuta, has an almost independent command. His boys are his in a very special sense, because he chooses them himself. A housemaster normally keeps his house for 16 years. Some 13 years before he gets it, the headmaster will tell him that he may begin to make his list. That is, a list of the boys he will accept in his house when he gets it. Whether your newborn son goes to Eton or not depends on persuading a master who is making up his list to take him. Houses vary very greatly, depending on the housemaster. If he's fond of rowing, for instance, the boys will be influenced to row. More important are his values, and these can range between a strict Puritanism and a spirit of laissez-faire. It's the luck of the draw. To assist him in the administration of his house, the housemaster appoints a house captain and together they select a committee of senior boys. These are known as his library. They sit with him at meals and they're responsible for all matters of petty discipline and organization and in consultation with him, the punishment of offenders in these minor categories. It costs 17 pounds a week to keep your boy at Eton. The demand for places is enormous and probably because their parents are more aware of this, 60% of the boys are old Etonian sons. They're entered at birth, even at conception, though this practice is strictly forbidden. Oh, very dismal. Get inside. Mr. Bennett. Yes, sir. How many are you with half, Peter? Oh, nine, it's a bit. There's a very intricate system of order cards and tickets and markings, all in the nature of reports on the boy's progress or conduct. These can be made by any beak, and they all have to be shown by the boy to his house tutor. The house tutor's room, therefore, is a sort of clearing house for information about his boys. He can never be unaware of their problems. This showing up goes on every day immediately after boys' dinners. Francis, this is my for Later, Thank you. You don't seem to be making very much of a success of your French. I think that's an improvement on last half, sir. You do? Yes, sir. It doesn't seem to think very highly of your prepared work. Well, no, it's the, only the essays, sir, the out-of-school works. Sir. Yes, but do you think perhaps you're giving enough time for these essays? Well, I, I think so, yes, When do you do them? Um, well, after nine, sometimes, sir. Well, I think probably you ought to devote a little bit more time, and then you might be more successful. Yes, sir. Right. It must have been rather kind to you, really. Yes. Right, last, I want you to go down to Red and just get half a dozen eggs, two tins of peaches and a pound of sugar with you. Only the library have the privilege of shouting for a boy, and any fag who hears the call must answer it. The last man there gets the job.
You others go away. Fawn.